here to help you with breeze planting seeds and teaching skills teachers turn schoolyards to trees Hello and welcome to School Gardens with Ease podcast. I'm Leila Mireskandari, your host, and this is episode number 15 and part 5 of the topic of how to pitch your annual vegetable school garden project and how to create a proposal or a presentation for it. In the past four episodes, I went through a list of items you need in such a proposal that you need to tell people that you're building an annual vegetable garden and why that's the type of garden that you have chosen to build at the school. Why are you proposing to do this in the first place? Meaning, what are all the benefits of a school garden? Who will be doing what in this garden and what will you be teaching and growing? When will it all happen? And where will it all happen, including, you know, a high-level design and placement? And finally, what's the cost of this project? I also went through the details of almost all of these items in the previous episode. In this final episode of this series, let's talk about a few design ideas, permaculture design ideas, that are easy to build with your class, will save you tons of money, and, listen to this, will help you build a regenerative, water-conserving, long-term, soil-building, productive garden easily. A truly impressive garden. Now, I will not get into the details of these designs because that deserves its own episode or two, but enough for your pitch. Let's talk about the cost of this project also so that we can wrap it up in this episode. I'd like to also tell you that I've summarized all of these five episodes and put together a downloadable PDF for you that's in the show notes. Go ahead and download that. The first thing I want to say about the concept of design is that you technically don't need to have it drawn out before you start the project. I'm a landscape designer and I always tell the opposite to my homeowner clients. I always tell them that we need to design first before we even think about anything else. But for an educational garden, it's very different because designing the garden could be a lesson that connects to math and science as well as arts so well. So ideally, your students could even design the garden as part of a school assignment and of course, under the design guidelines that you will need to give them because they're supposed to be learning here. I understand that people listening to your pitch could have a lot of resistance to this idea though. Many grant applications want you to include the design in the application before they even consider giving you, uh, you know, the funds. Believe me when I say I've seen this happening so many times. So take this idea of your students designing the garden as it resonates and as an ideal that you might, that might or might not fit your situation. What I have found helpful in these types of cases is for you to have an overall design design in mind and, you know, uh, present that for approval to get the funds and then also tell people that your student, that you will be teaching your students how to design a garden and you will be connecting it to science and math and all of that and that you will lead your students to, you know, design something very similar to what you've presented to people. Let's get into this. First things first, consider natural curves. I want to open your eyes to the fact that your garden does not have to be in straight rows and square garden beds. Your garden can look like a snail, a snake, a mandela. It can represent the wind or the ocean waves. You don't have to limit your and your students' creativity to, you know, squares and straight lines. In fact, I would encourage you to design as curvy as a garden as you can. That is actually one of the principles in permaculture. The more your garden has natural curves, the more natural elements such as wind, water, and sunlight will work well with it. Now, the first permaculture design technique I want to, um, I want you to pay attention to is called hugo culture. It's spelled H-U-G-E-L-K-U-L-T-U-R. It's a very fancy name for a very simple concept of topping up wood 
with soil. Simply put, a hugo culture garden is a pile of wood that's topped up with soil and then planted in. Some people dig the ground, bury the, food, the, the wood so that at the end their garden is level with the ground. And some people just pile up the wood, top it up with, you know, right there, right on top of the grass, and then top it up with soil and plant in that. The second approach is what I would recommend to schools for two reasons. First of all, digging the ground is hard work that kids cannot do, period. So don't even go there because it's also completely unnecessary. And number two, it's best that you start with fresh soil that you curated and ordered from a reliable source because you don't know what's in the soil beneath your feet. And testing soil for toxicity in a waste is a, in my opinion, is a waste of time and money. Just don't dig into it. Do not even consider using the soil because most probably when you test it, it's going to be toxic. Plant in a soil that you know is healthy. Now, why Google Culture Gardens? Simply because they are miraculous, unbelievably water conserving, because the wood acts like a sponge holding onto the water that your students give to it in spring or all the rain that comes in spring and then releases that water during the drier summer months. This makes the garden water conserving, which reduces the need for watering during summer significantly. And I mean significantly. It's also a long-term soil building technique as the wood will slowly decompose over years and turn into rich soil. Hugo culture has many other benefits too that I don't get into right now because it needs its own episode, but I encourage you to look into it. Where would all the wood come from, you might be asking? I would first look around your school and see if there's any wooded area, a national park, or a trail, you know, in walking distance so that you can visit with your students. These areas usually have lots of fallen wood branches and stumps. Plan for a little walk with your students to collect the wood. And remember that you will be using the wood as is. No shredding is needed. In fact, you should not use shredded or mulched wood for hugo culture. You should use the whole wood. Even stumps, if you have a way to transport them into your garden, use bigger stumps too. You could also ask the parents to collect and bring the wood in, I don't know, a contest or some sort of event. I've seen schools do this very successfully. If your parents are not helpful, or they can't help, or there is no wooded area in walking distance, maybe plan a field trip somewhere and include collecting wood as part of that field trip. There are so many different ways you can gather the wood for a small hugo culture garden, garden that does not need a lot of funds. The second permaculture technique I want to bring to your attention is called sheet mulching. Please look into it. It's the best way to turn a grass area into a garden in a very short period of time without digging the grass, which is a super and almost impossible thing to do for the students. And all it needs is cardboard. There's lots that you can, you know, gather around the town on recycling days. You could also ask parents to collect some and bring you. If you use sheet mulching to turn the grass area into garden by topping up the garden areas with soil and the path areas with wood mulch, I dare to say you don't even need raised beds, containers, or even anything that physically defines the garden. You can design the most beautiful gardens with all kinds of pretty curves. And if you use hookah culture, your garden bed will be naturally raised and you'd be surprised how well the wood underneath the soil will hold on to the soil and, you know, without any borders or any containers. This means you won't need to spend any money on raised beds or containers or anything else for that matter. And your garden can be designed by your students and even built by them, which means you won't need to spend any money on building the garden either. All you need to budget for are soil, mulch, seeds, a hose, a chest to house the hose, uh, and a bunch of small buckets and hand shovels for your students to be able to move the soil and mulch into the garden. Now, if you plan to have your students design the garden, what design guidelines should you and your students follow? Because even though permaculture design techniques bring you freedom and flexibility, there are still design rules that you should follow to make sure that the garden flows 
functions, and is accessible. Those guidelines are all in the OASIS school program, which will give you step-by-step growing activity guides done for your lesson plans, student booklets, classroom wall posters, and coaching with me. But I promise that I will dig deeper into the topic of design in future episodes for you. All right, we are finally at the last part. This is last but definitely not least, cost. This is what everybody is waiting for and it has to come last because without the previous components of your plan, you cannot talk about cost. The most cost-effective type of garden is a classroom garden. All it needs in terms of purchases are the following. You need seeds, bags of potting soil, party cups to plant in, you know, tablecloths, uh, pushpins, container buckets, and some dollar store craft material for, you know, the experiments. Like if you want to build a solar cooker, for example, when you're teaching about sun or a herb drying rack, when you're teaching about herbs, for example, and lesson plans. The exact dollar amount number depends on how many, you know, seed varieties you want to grow, what you want to do. Uh, and, you know, you can have a ballpark estimate of, you know, all that physical material. And the cost of lesson plans also depends on how many gardening lessons you want to teach. Um, I talked about this in details in previous episodes, and I even told you how to write those lesson plans. I also have programs that will give you those lesson plans, plus student booklets, plus classroom wall posters, step-by-step growing guides and coaching with me. No matter if you purchase a program like mine or you want to write your own lessons, make sure you are compensated for it. Don't be a hero and commit to doing this on your personal time. This will lead to burnout and your work will not be appreciated because unfortunately, people don't know the value of things they don't pay for. And that will lead to resentment. Please believe me when I say, I am saying this for your own good, even though I would love for you to, you know, buy my program, but I'm not saying this to sell you my programs. I'm genuinely worried about you. If you don't know the value of your own time, effort, and expertise, you can never expect anyone else to do it. You have to value it yourself first. Your time, effort, and expertise has they have value and so do mine. Go check out the Oasis series of programs from the show notes because that will at least give you an idea about the cost of lesson plans. There's also one thing that most teachers won't need and that is grow lights. I say most don't need it because all you really need for a classroom garden is a sunny window that you can set up a table or two in front of where, I mean, somewhere in your school, it doesn't even have to be in your own classroom because you can do the work in your classroom and then transport those plants to that window. But if you definitely cannot find such a window anywhere in your school, then you'll need to, you know, purchase grow lights. The second most expensive garden is, of course, an outdoor school garden because on top of everything that you have to purchase for a classroom garden, you'll need to also purchase material for the outdoor space. If you use the permaculture design ideas I just gave you, which means you don't need to purchase raised beds or containers, then you'll save lots of money, but you'll still need to purchase organically made bulk soil and, you know, wood mulch for your path areas, um, a good quality lightweight fabric hose with a good nozzle at the tip, and a few items to make what I call a watering chest um, to house the hose and your watering equipment. I have a complete guide for this setup that I will link in the show notes. If you don't use my suggested permaculture techniques and insist on building a conventional garden with raised beds, then you'll have to budget for that too. Of course, I highly recommend those permaculture design techniques because they're educational, environmental, and low maintenance benefits way goes beyond the cost. I honestly would not understand why you wouldn't go with those design techniques. But of course, that's ultimately your decision to make. There are also many things people think they need to purchase for a school garden that are complete waste of money. Examples of those are 
fencing and I have explained why I don't recommend fencing the garden in previous episodes. Another example is wheelbarrows, big shovels, and gloves. When working with a class of 20, 30 students to build a garden, you'll need many small hand shovels and not, you know, one or two big shovels that are heavy. You'll also need many small buckets to move the soil and mulch and, you know, you know, having a big wheelbarrow that's expensive, you know, who's going to use that? That's for adults, not for 20 or 30 students to work with. Don't waste your money on gloves because your soil needs to be good quality organically made and free of all harmful chemicals anyway. You can't purchase harmful, crappy soil and think that gloves would solve your problems. I don't know about you, but where I teach, gloves are expensive. And when your soil is good quality and organically made, you want the kids to touch that soil. It grounds them and connects them with the earth. Expensive automatic watering equipment is another thing that you don't need to waste your money on. I have seen those create more problems than broad benefits. Just the good old hose is the best way to go. But make sure that you do invest in a good old hose and never rely on watering cans. To summarize, this educational garden starts with growing from seed in the classroom. Then if you have a garden outside, because you don't have to, you'll need the material for that. And remember, the material you need for an outside educational garden is on top of the material you'll need for the starting the seeds indoors, because you have to do that first. You'll have to start the indoors, uh, start indoors. And no matter if your seedlings are being donated, sold, or taken home, or being transplanted in the garden, you'll need to do that. And you'll need to purchase the lesson plans that help you teach this garden into existence. So to quickly go over your purchase or costs, you need seeds, bags of potting soil, party cups, tablecloths, pushpins, container buckets, and some dollar store craft material for your experiments. Then if you have an outdoor garden, you'll also need bulk soil, bulk mulch, a good hose, a watering chest, again, links are in the show notes, and last but not least, lesson plans. And this last piece, the lesson plan, is the crucial piece that makes your garden an educational garden, makes it possible possible for you to use your class time to grow the garden and makes it possible for you and your students to engage with the garden while learning not only how to grow food, but also the science, the math, the language, and the arts behind it while they grow, you know, go through uh, this amazing life-changing experience of growing their own food. Without the lesson plans, none of that that I just described is possible. So make sure to budget for it. And my links are in the show notes or at least budget for you to, you know, get your lesson plans together. And this concludes this episode series on how to pitch your annual vegetable garden. Let me know if you want to know more about anything school garden related so I can answer your questions in future episodes. Also, go into the show notes if you're curious about the OSS series of programs, if you want to download the summer summary for all of these pitching episodes or email me. I'm here to help. Flip me an email at laidlawm at kidsgrowingcity.ca and I'll talk to you soon in another episode. You've listened to the entire episode and for that, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I hope you enjoyed it and if you did, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And please share this episode with other teachers who might be interested in this topic. See you next week for a new episode.